and I would say the specifics of those recusals until I actually called the case. Uh, this is case number 115250 in the matter of Bruce Harrington. And I just wanted to indicate on the record that our colleagues, Justice Lukert and Justice Rosen, are recused and sitting in their seats at this time and fully participating in the ultimate resolution of this case are two district judges. Immediately to my right, this is the Honorable Michael Quint. He sits in the 25th Judicial District in Garden City. And to his far right, this is Judge Bedner, who sits in Atchison, the 1st Judicial District. And uh, I don't know how much further we could get these two judges apart, Garden City to Atchison, but I'd say about 350 miles separates them. In any event, they have fully read all the materials. They will be participating in the oral arguments this morning and our case conference this afternoon until this matter is ultimately resolved. And I just wanted to thank both of these distinguished jurists for helping out the Supreme Court today. All right. With that, counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, may it please the court, Stan Hasler, appearing from the Disciplinary Administrator's Office. I would uh, request two minutes of rebuttal. Please. Two minutes is granted. Uh, we had a hearing on this matter on January 21st of 2016. The respondent appeared at that hearing without counsel. A uh, hearing involved two complaints, and I'd like to kind of briefly summarize those two complaints. Uh, DA 11,998, uh, the NH estate. Uh, the respondent had represented N.H. and her husband, R.H., for a number of years. He described them as, as good friends for a number of years. Uh, R.H. died in, on December 30th of 2012. On January 3rd of 2013, uh, the respondent prepared a durable power of attorney for, for N.H. Um, the panel found that N.H. suffered from dementia at the time that that occurred. Also found from the testimony that... Um, that NH actually entered, entered hospice care the following day after the durable power of attorney was signed. Uh, she passed did away. They, did they find any violation for obtaining a power of attorney from a person without capacity to? What they found was to grant that, that, power. that the respondent violated uh, KRPC 1.8 in that he took advantage of information that he gained during the course of the representation to her disadvantage. He, and that he knew that she suffered from dementia and that she was in bad medical condition. So that's, I, I think that's as close as it gets. Okay. Um, she passed away on February 8th of 2013. On February 19th of 2013, the respondent filed a petition for probate in her estate. Uh, from January 10th of 2013 until uh, June 18th of 2013, the respondent paid himself $30,946 in fees either as a result of the power of attorney, using the power of attorney, durable power of attorney, or after the estate was filed, uh, paying himself fees without court approval. Uh, the estate itself consisted of three bank accounts at CapFed, two bank accounts and a CD at Quest Credit Union, two insurance refunds, and a tax refund. Uh, the panel also found that the respondent had misled the court on two occasions in the, in the estate matter. Number one, he represented when he filed the petition for probate that he was the alternative executor. That was not stated in the will, but that's what he represented to the court. As a result of that, he was appointed the executor of the estate. Uh, they also found that with respect to a pleading he filed in, in, in the probate matter, uh, in which he indicated that he had paid himself $5,196 for work that he had done for the husband while he was still alive, legal work he had done for the husband while he was still alive, that that was not true. Uh, there was some concern expressed by the fact that he would even pay him, he obviously paid himself that amount of money without court approval, but there was some concern expressed about whether or not uh, her estate would be responsible for paying those fees, for her husband's uh, attorney's fees. What, what happened at the hearing was that there was evidence presented from the respondent's own um, uh, fee records or billing records that that work done, that $5,196 was work done actually on her estate, showing work done on her estate and had nothing to do with the husband's estate. Uh, the panel found that the respondent had violated the following rules. 1.5, unreasonable fees. 1.8b, using information gained from the uh, 
NH representation to her detriment and to the detriment of the estate. 3.3, misleading Judge Yeoman, the, dis the district court judge here in Shawnee County who heard the case on two different occasions. 8.4C, regarding his statements regarding the $5,196, uh, both in the, in, the, in the pleading that he filed with the court, in his testimony at the disciplinary proceeding, and, and his statements made to the investigator during the course of the disciplinary investigation. And 8.4D, conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice, by paying himself fees without court approval in the probate matter. Uh, in case 12,163, S.A., again by the testimony uh, of the respondent, uh, another good friend of his, retained him to file a determination of dissent, which he did. Uh, the purpose was to determine the ownership of stocks, which S.A. had found, uh, in the amount of $56,000. She was not sure who was entitled to receive those stocks. It was determined in the determination of dissent case that S.A. and her brother were entitled to a quarter each and that the stepmother was entitled to, uh, to one half. So to S.A.'s stepmother was entitled to one half. Uh, the respondent, in fact, paid uh, a quarter each to S.A. and to her brother. Stepmother couldn't be found. Um, there was a hearing before the court and with respect to this $56,000, and the respondent had asked permission from the court to allow the $56,000 to be placed into his, into, into his trust account, which the court granted uh, that to happen. Um, at that, uh, up until that point, the money was just going to be paid into the district court. Um, the respondent admitted at the hearing that uh, from years 2008 through 2012 that he had converted, converted approximately that $25,000 from his trust account. Um, the money was to have been paid if the stepmother couldn't be found, was to be, was to be paid into the unclaimed property division of the state of Kansas. That just didn't happen. Um, the evidence was that when it was discovered that the money had been converted, that the respondent went out and borrowed $25,000 and then paid that money to the Unclaimed Property Act. Rule violations here were that the respondent failed to handle the estate diligently, took a fee in excess of what the court awarded. At the, at the hearing on the determination of dissent, the court said you're entitled to $2,475. He took a fee of $3,000 out of the money he had in his trust account. Uh, 1.15 conversion of the $25,000, which he specifically admitted that he converted the money at the hearing uh, that, that we had in this matter. The panel also found that that was a violation of 8.4C, uh, which he admitted uh, on the record at this hearing. Uh, a violation of 8.1, failure to answer uh, the investigator's questions and to provide documents that we requested during the course of the investigation. Um, at the hearing, the respondent and in his answer admitted the misconduct in connection with the $25,000, but he vehemently denied that he engaged in any misconduct with respect to the NH matter. Uh, he took exceptions. He filed a brief. Um, the first issue I'd like to address is the issue about whether the panel committed error in not granting his continuance. The respondent claims a due process violation because the, the denial of his, because of the the denial of his request for a continuance did not allow him to obtain counsel. Um, the hearing was on January 21st of 2000, excuse me, just a second. The hearing was on January 21st of 2016. Uh, the respondent filed a request for a continuance on January 8th of 2016. Um, I filed a response to that request for a continuance that very same day, and I attached a letter to my motion that the respondent had sent to me dated December 1st of 2015, so about a month and a half prior to the hearing date. In that letter, the respondent stated he wanted Billy Rourke as his lawyer, but that he had been hospitalized, Mr. Rourke had been hospitalized for 60 days prior to that time, was still not on his feet, that he had attempted to, or contacted a couple of other lawyers about representing him, but he really wanted Mr. Rourke as, as his lawyer. Um, the panel concluded, and I argued, that given the fact that he knew December 1st of 2015 that Mr. Rourke had been in the hospital and still not back on his feet, that there certainly was the possibility that Mr. Rourke was not going to be able to represent him in the disciplinary hearing. And the panel also said, you know, these matters are very serious. You've had time to find counsel. 
we need to get this matter moving, and so the, 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 the uh, request for continuance was denied. Um, it's clear from the record that what the respondent was trying to do was to buy time. In fact, those are the very words he used uh, during the hearing, or in the transcript. I'm just trying to buy time here. I have 62 clients left. I need six months to close out these cases. Um, he has filed a brief, but there's no way his brief can be viewed as a legitimate attempt to argue or justify his positions uh, in this disciplinary case. Uh, I'm sure if you reviewed that, uh, you would come to that conclusion. Second issue, uh, did the fact that Well, let's, let's uh, answer another question here. Uh, did he not also ask for appointed counsel? He did ask for appointed counsel. And so he's raised that issue, has he not? Uh, do we have to address whether he would have been entitled to appointed counsel? You know, uh, I, I believe that he asked that for appointed counsel at the hearing, but I don't believe he raised that issue in his brief. So your, your position is that the issue of whether an attorney facing disbarment's entitled to uh, appointment of counsel has been waived or abandoned on appeal? Correct. Okay. Uh, second issue, um, did the fact that he paid back the $25,000, does that mitigate uh, what he did? Um, given that fact, does, it justify, does, it, does the misconduct still justify this bargain? Well, there's a lot of other misconduct besides that, but I would say, you know, he admitted converting the $25,000. Uh, he drew the money down over a four-year period of time to $27. He, on multiple occasions, he took that, that money out of the, his trust account. Each one of those separate acts would have involved criminal, uh, a criminal act. Um, and this was after he convinced the court to allow him to place the money in his trust account. Uh, because the court was just going to keep it um, with the, the clerk of the district court. But he convinced uh, Judge Yeoman to allow him to put this money in his trust account. Um, you know, it's... What, what happened was, after the four-year period of time, uh, the respondent received a letter from S.A., uh, the, uh, his client in the matter, and the letter, which is part of the record, of course, said, Dear Bruce, I am writing to follow up on several conversations we've had concerning the balance of the funds remaining in my father's estate. I've received the dissent decree entered back in 2008, provided that, I believe the dissent decree entered back in 2008 provided that my stepmother's share was to be paid into the clerk or otherwise held in trust pending locating her. As she has still not been located, we discuss the, that fact that her share needs to be paid over to the state of Kansas unclaimed property fund. We spoke about it a few weeks ago. You told me you would complete the forms for the Kansas unclaimed property fund. I mentioned that I am familiar with the process from my time with probate practice. The forms are not difficult. This is one of the things that Charlie wants to make certain that are done. So, but for the fact that four years later he receives this letter, he realizes that that SA knows that the money has not been paid in the Unclaimed Property Act. The strong inference would be that the money would never have been paid. The respondent would not have borrowed the twenty-five thousand dollars to to pay this money back. Um, so it's like forced restitution. I mean, I don't believe the respondent should get any credit under these circumstances. I mean, I'm glad the money was paid back, but it's because of the circumstances to avoid detection in his mind. The third issue, uh, he takes the position that he didn't misuse the dur durable power of attorney. I mean, if you look at his brief, that's it. I mean, he, he just basically says, I did not misuse the power of attorney. Um, I would say, you know, he vehemently denied any misconduct with respect to this. Uh, what he says and what the panel found is in direct contrast with each other. Uh, you know, he paid himself $30,000 in fees. Uh, with respect to much of that, uh, using that durable power of attorney, uh, the panel found that what he paid himself was clearly unreasonable. Uh, he negotiated a settlement with the estate in which he paid back $10,000. The panel found that still, I mean, even having paid back $10,000, that fee was unreasonable. Uh, getting to your point, Justice Johnson, uh, the panel found that the respondent took advantage of, of NH's mental condition with respect to that power of attorney. The information he had about her, the information about her dementia, the information about her finances, and that was used to the detriment of, of NH. Um, 
Wasn't there also a complaint about the um, uh, complaint to your office wasn't in writing from office mate? Where where does that where does that fit in? Wasn't there a denied due process? Yes, he he said um, he did say he he made a complaint, and that is an issue in his brief. He said the fact he said that the complaint would have to be in writing. Um, his understanding of the complaint would have to be in writing. Um, actually, what was sent to him, and we did receive information from a source, which did happen to be his office mate at the time, uh, which we followed up and looked into, and then we documented a complaint, and we told, we told him in the complaint um, exactly what it was our concern was. I mean, we looked into what we were told. We looked at the court file. Uh, we thought there was a problem. We sent him a letter told him, the matter was going to be docketed for investigation. We said, we are specifically concerned about your handling of these funds in this estate. And we would like you to respond to that. So to suggest that there's a, some sort of due process violation in, 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 in that, um, I, I, I just don't believe it exists. The panel makes reference to it um, in its report saying it doesn't in any way diminish its culpability and that the disciplinary administrator's office did not attempt to introduce any hearsay statements uh, for whatever was said when the information came to our In to our other attention. words, if someone that uh, contacts your, your office with information about a potential uh, violation of the Kansas Rules of Professional Conduct by an attorney has a bad motive for doing so, um, that doesn't change your investigation of the violation. The motive of the reporter it really has nothing to do with this, does it? Well, it might, but um, it, it, you know we would take into consideration the motive when trying to decide whether or not there was validity to the complaint. But I would also direct attention um, to the court of Supreme Court Rule Two Thirteen that says the unwillingness or neglect of a complainant to sign a complaint um, shall not necessarily justify abate, uh, abatement of the complaint. So, I mean, if somebody's reluctant to go forward for, uh, it could be a variety of reasons. Well, and the due process right here is not to have the complainant sign the complaint or what have you. It's the right to be put on notice, right? Right. Correct, Justice Siegel. And clearly the respondent has been placed on notice about what the charges were against him. I mean, under the circumstances, I thought it was very important that when we sent out the complaint letter to him that he understand exactly what it is that we were concerned about. Counsel, I think that takes us to the last issue, and that is your recommendation for discipline. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, panel recommended disbarment. All of the standards uh, that were set out in the panel report, and I think there were three of them, suggest that disbarment is the appropriate discipline. Um, you know, he's violated his duties to his clients by safeguarding funds to the system due to his dishonesty with the courts, to the legal profession because of his lack of cooperation in the investigation and his dishonesty during the investigation. He acted knowingly and intentionally. Uh, he was motivated by dishonesty. There were multiple offenses. He engaged in criminal activity. Every time he took money out of that, his trust account, that was not his. Uh, in conclusion, uh, our recommendation was disbarment as well. Um, there is a real concern here about the protection of the public. I mean, the respondent testified at the hearing that he had 62 clients remaining at the time of that hearing. Um, but he just wanted to clean things up. Well, given what happened in these two previous cases, we have to be, I believe, terribly concerned about what's happened in the interim with those clients or what will happen if he's allowed to continue to practice law. The fact there had been a motion for temporary suspension in this case that's correct. I followed. How did that uh, fit temporarily with the uh, continuance request? In other words, w did you ask for a temporary suspension prior to the uh, motion for continuance? No, I did not. We had the hearing. Um, the panel report was okay. issued. They suggested that we ask for temporary suspension. Uh, we asked for temporary suspension, I think, sometime in April of 2016. Okay. Uh, which was which was denied. Okay. All right. Any further questions? Thank you, Council.
May it please the court, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Bruce Harrington, I'm representing myself in regard to this hearing. It may not mean anything to you, but I want to express to you how profoundly ashamed I am to be standing here in front of you under these circumstances. I really don't have a whole lot to say. I've been practicing law for 48 and a half years. This may not be to my advantage to tell you this. I've served as a pro tem Shawnee County District Court judge for 35 years. I should have known better, I guess would be an appropriate question or response. Never had a judicial complaint filed against me in 35 years. This is the second. These two cases before you today are the second disciplinary actions filed against me in 48 and a half years. Your Honor, it is categorically untrue that I went and borrowed the $25,000 and put it back and paid it into the treasurer after it was discovered. That is categorically and positively untrue. I did it before this complaint ever arose. I did it back in 2012, which was three years before these complaints came to surface. I abused my discretion with uh, Mrs. Hubbard's power of attorney. The administrator at the nursing home where she was at knew I was concerned about that and consulted with, her, with me about it. Her personal physician and I exchanged in writing letters about her ability and he said she had lucid intervals and she needs someone to help her manage her accounts. Written complaint, Rule 209 says, shall be in writing. Mandatory, not permissive language. It's not in writing. My lovely and talented office mate, God bless his soul, now deceased, at the Y steam room decided that as he threatened me, my, my office mate, I know where the skeletons are, that he would get Mr. Hazlitt's office involved in this. Your Honor, you asked the question, what was his motive? His motive was he owed me $5,000 for office expenses, and I told him I was going to sue him, and that's when he advised me where the skeletons were, and that he knew where they were, and that he'd take care of my, quote, a threat to get money that he owed me for office expenses. Mr. Hazlitt, uh, when I questioned him about a written complaint, well, we all know what uh, propensity for gossip your office mate, Mr. Miller, has. Yeah, we, we, we truly do. I don't know how relevant that is, but I think it is important because, <clears throat> well, I'm not going to say that because I don't want to disparage somebody who's, who's deceased and who I knew and thought was my friend for 35 years, but you can draw your own conclusions about that. I'm 73 years old. I'm not in the best of physical health. I don't say any of that in justification of my conduct, just in general knowledge. I guess it's easy for me to stand here and say, well, I paid the $25,000 into the clerk of the court. Oh, one other point, and then I'll hang this up. Judge Yeoman knew that the money was either going to go in my trust account or into the court. And I specifically asked him, where, where do you want it to go? I'll put it with the clerk of the court. No, I'll put it in your trust account. Had I been scheming at that point, it's sure funny that, um, well, I'll withdraw that statement. There's nothing funny about this matter. 
I'd like to have a little more time to close out my existing files. I have a 42-year-old daughter who's an attorney in Lawrence, and she can assist me doing that. I know you wouldn't appoint her as my supervisor, as so to speak, but I've got plenty of friends here in town who would be willing to do that. Terry Beck is a possible choice. Billy Rourke, he's not in the hospital anymore. He's not in the best of shape, but he's in a position where he could do that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, what was the, uh, the I'm sorry? date? I'm looking up the date of the uh, hearing report. It's February 10th, 2016. So, yes, what, nine months ago? Ballpark, yes, Your Honor. Eight or nine months. What steps have you taken during that time to wind up your practice, as you say, or to close out your practice? Going broke, trying to pay my bills, and turning away clients, finishing up stuff that is still pending. As you know, these matters in various district courts can go on and on and on and on. Got a couple personal injury cases pending that that uh, trying to get settled. And what time are you asking us to give to you to, quote, close out your practice, unquote? 90 days, I think, would be sufficient for me to <clears throat> get things buttoned up and shuffled off to my daughter. I don't suppose there would be any problem with me passing them off to my daughter. She's a licensed and practicing attorney, and I could turn over the files to her and advise her if she asked, and try and help her button it up. All right. You have any other presentation for us today? No, Your Honor. Thank you so much for your attention and kindness. Let me ask if we have any questions. I hear none. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. You reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Actually, Your Honor, I would waive rebuttal unless you have any questions of me. I hear no questions. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. We thank both of you for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement. Thank